this is the third uh, time that I'm talking about communities I've lived in. And I now realize I'm going backwards, you know, from, I haven't talked about this place much anymore, but this place is the culmination of all the communities I've lived in, or my attitude in this place has to do with all the things I learned by being in community over the years. And so the first one was the yurts, which is the most recent one. And then I did, what did I do next? Idlewild, oh yes, the Idlewild Hotel. Each one is different, you know, has a different flavor to it, but every one of them has to do with a constant balancing act, at least within myself, and I'm sure within everybody, when you, when you look at it, between living with other people and being yourself, and how, how to do that, how to, in, how to absolutely incorporate dynamically that combination of individuality and community. Okay, so then, now I'm going back even further, and this one starts in the mid-70s. And But I need to give a little backstory to it to, to announce why it happened in the first place. Uh, I had returned home to be with my high school boyfriend. This was in Twin Falls, Idaho. And we got married after 12 years, uh, being apart from one another. And it was a rom very romantic time for one year and then the second year it was like what are we doing together and I started to realize that I couldn't really stay married even though I loved him and so that led to him then finally leaving town and moving to another uh, state where he edited another newspaper he was a newspaper publisher and um, I stayed there and which surprised me I didn't realize I was going to stay in my hometown but then the publisher of the newspaper there invited me to write a set of columns called Coming Back Home, which I did. Uh, uh, it was eight, eight columns in all, and they ended up being this huge uproar in the community because I'd written these columns. And I'm going to put those columns on my website so that you'll know what they were because they were like, it just disturbed the town to receive these columns uh, because it was uh, somebody from you know the 50s coming back and looking at her hometown and how it had changed and um, it was very provocative they were very provocative and uh, finally the publisher said to me I can't do this any longer because the, I, it's just taking all my time people are calling me constantly saying get rid of her get rid of her get rid of her and everybody in the newsroom is loving what you're doing and so forth and so there's this huge um, uh, interplay you might call it or polarity you might call it between the two and he finally couldn't do it anymore and so I said okay graciously bowed out then I got together with this man who was rich and I was poor I might have told this story before I think I did the money money story story how I got Munchkin House I ever tell that story I think you did yeah I think I did too anyway I ended up with a house that he bought for me and it was a little house that we called Munchkin House. And so there I was, still in my hometown, wondering what am I supposed to do now? And I decided what I'd do is I'd give back to the community because I'd received this house gratis. And I'd also open up the space of what I was doing by writing those coming home columns so that everybody could have space to cre create and express themselves not just me. And so that was really the origin story of Open Space, which was this magazine which ran for three years, two of them when I was the head of it. And it was an extraordinary experience of in this town, which is dominated by uh, or regular religions, uh, to have all these characters in little dark corners coming out and meeting each other and speaking and writing and drawing and uh, composing poems and interviewing each other and uh, it was an amazing time it was like this big uh, it was a thing that coalesced a, an enormous number of of weird strangers inside a very normal town um, so opening up the space opening up the space and uh, I realized that that really is the job of my life, is opening up the space. But this is the first time it was actually accomplished. And so there we were in the little munchkin house, and I had the, the downstairs, the, the basement, had the um, light tables in it. Where we, Remember, this was the 70s, not like now, where we'd, we'd um, put together the whole thing. 
And then uh, upstairs was our editorial office, meaning that was the dining uh, round, oak round table where we uh, talked things out about what this issue was going to be and so forth. And I did all the typesetting. I'd go down to this place which let me do it there. And I was having a hard time with the machine. And finally, I you know made friends with the machine. And then I had no more hard times with it. But I want to tell you that this... The, there was a dark side to this. There was a shadow side. There's always a shadow side. And it showed up in me in that I wanted to be perfect. I really wanted to be the guru. and But the guru has to be perfect. and But I smoked. But I didn't want anybody to know. So I smoked in secret. I was very secretive with my addiction, which I just thought was terrible that I would have that addiction, but I still had it. And so there I was every day having to hide this other side of myself to be the shining leader for the whole town. One thing I did do uh, that was really helpful for myself at that time was every morning I'd get up and I'd write down, I mean, this is a big, this is a big thing to do this huge, Little news wasn't big, but the newspaper was like, you know, sometimes, you know, 20 pages, 24 pages, newspaper size, and tabloid size, I should say. And it was, I think we put it out once a month. And uh, so I'd write down everything I was going to do that day that had to do with what, what was necessary for that day. And I'd always read the I Ching, and that was the first time I ever did anything like that. I read the I Ching every day and tried to practice its principles. So there I was, wanting to be perfect, wanting to be the guru, and, and yet I was imperfect and knew it, and so I was hiding my addiction. And yet I was also working with a whole different way of thinking by reading the I Ching, which I really recommend if, if nobody's done it. And so there, there, there lies, you know, the, the contradiction within myself between the light and the dark, you might say, or the part that wants to stay hidden because she's got to be perfect, she thinks. Um, and it, it, it was an amazing experience that we went through as a group, however. What I did was do, I had soups every, all the time. I had a soup on the stove so that anybody who came in the door could have a bowl of soup. I also made this beautiful, wonderful, very thick German bread every week, twice a week, and I'd make four or five loaves, and whoever came in first got the first loaf, and it was, so it was, there was this flow of people that were constantly being rewarded by coming in the door. So the, the community wasn't the house inside, well, it was the house, yes, but it wasn't that they all lived there, it was that they came there um, to have this experience with each other, and it became, uh, again, something that the whole town started talking about, just like my, my um, columns had been. And one day, I think probably my, my most favorite um, memory of this experience was the day that the farmer backed his truck up to the back door. And I didn't even know this guy, but he came in, he knocked on the door, and then he said that he had a 50-pound bag of beans for me, um, for the soup, he said. So he'd heard about the soup, he'd heard about the whole experience, and he wanted to contribute. Very shy man, but it was an incredible experience to have him come there and, and celebrate and affirm what we were doing in this very utopian uh, community magazine that we had created together. It was a very, um, um, very Aquarian publication in the sense that it wasn't dominated by any single person and everybody felt completely free to be exactly themselves uh, which I always celebrate. Uh, so this this went on but uh, speaking of my shadow what I started to attract then was alcoholic men to myself and every time I'd find out they were alcoholic I would get rid of them until finally one came who basically um, took me on his journey and I think I've talked about that too the Phil story did I tell the Phil story already yeah so that's that's another video that you can pick up on if you want but the point is I've had a very peripatetic life I've learned all sorts of things I've entered many many adventures many many experiments of this type especially at the community in fact I want to do one more 
um, which will be my the experience with New College, where I was fired finally, and then the little uh, forest community after that, um, all part of the same thing in the early 70s, and then, then I'll be done with this series. But each one uh, offered many things to reflect upon all my life, and each one um, offered me an understanding of myself that I didn't have before it happened. And so I, I'm grateful for them all and grateful for the people that I've known. Sometimes, sometimes I still know them, uh, sometimes I don't. Um, you know, people move through our lives, we, we know them for a while, and then, then they disappear, they may have died, or they may, may have just moved on, that we just had that karmic connection for a while, and then we keep going. So that, that was the story of open space in this tiny little house, this beautiful little house, uh, that we uh, just did this amazing little community-oriented project that was um, fun and, um, uh, you know, it was very informative. There was, I still have all the copies of it. Uh, very informative. Uh, lots, ha lots happened. It, was, it had depth to it at times. Um, it had lots of, of diversity in it, which is, was not uh, what, what that town was like at that time. And that was so wonderful to be able to celebrate that. So that's the story of Munchkin House. Thanks.